Hi everyone, it's Professor Primson. In this video we're going to finish up our discussion on models and applications. So from the previous video you'll remember that we use linear equations and a five-step strategy to solve word problems. Well in this video we're going to talk about how to use the five-step strategy to solve more traditional word problems that come from geometry or investing money or percent problems. So let's start with example four. The bar graph in the following figure shows the 10 most popular college majors with median, or in terms of statistics, it means the middle most salary, starting salaries for recent college graduates. The median starting salary of a business major exceeds that of a psychology major by $8,000. The median starting salary of an English major exceeds a psychology major by $3,000. And combined, their median starting salaries are $116,000. So you can see this kind of in the bar graph below. We're talking about three different majors. We have a psychology major graduate, an English major graduate, and a business major graduate. So we're talking about this column for business majors, English majors, and then psychology majors. So the other bars are not important for this problem. And the question is asking, determine the median starting salary of the psychology major, business major, and English major with bachelor's degrees. So after you've read the problem carefully, you've noticed that there's three different things that we're being asked to find in the problem. That does not mean that you need three variables. Notice in the problem that both English and business majors are being compared with their salaries to psychology graduate salary. So we don't need three variables. We just need one variable. So here's how. We're going to let X represent the starting mean salary For psychology graduates. So this is the first step of the five-step strategy is to represent X as one of the three majors. Now that if you remember from the previous video, the second step is to relate any unknowns that's in the problem back in terms of X. So let's look at the business major next. The business major exceeds a psychology major by 8,000. That means that we can represent business majors as X plus 8. The starting median salary for business majors. And the third major was the English majors. English majors exceeded psychology by 3,000. So in terms of X, which was representing psychology, that would be X plus 3. So and X plus 3 represents the starting salary, starting median salary for English majors. We only have one variable. We just have X, but we have representation for all three different majors in terms of X's now. You might be wondering where does the equation come from because the next step in the five-step process is to set up the equation, set up the linear equation that can be solved to find out what X equals. Notice that this last sentence says combined their median starting salaries are $116,000. If you add these three expressions together that is relating the starting salaries, then they should be equal to 116. So the three salaries combined which means added together is $116,000. So everything's in terms of thousands, so you don't actually have to write down 116,000 actually what it is. Everything's in thousands as the units. So if we take those three expressions, X for the psychology majors, X plus eight for business majors, X plus three for English majors, and add these together, it should be $116,000. So now let's solve the equation for X. So 
since we have a linear equation that only has one variable. We can get x by itself. So you can drop the parentheses all around x plus 8 and x plus 3 because we're not distributing anything other than 1. So x times x plus 8 plus x plus 3 is equal to 116. Combine like terms on the same side of the equation, you'll get 3x plus 11 equals 116. And then subtract 11 to move the constant term to the other side, away from the variable term. So 3x equals 105. And now I'll divide both sides of the equation by 3 to find out that x is equal to 35. Now what does this answer mean? Well, the units are in thousands, and it's in thousands of dollars. So this is $35,000 is the starting salary. for psychology major. So we figured out one of the three majors. We still have two majors left. So the starting salary for psychology majors was $35,000. let us figure out business majors next. Well, business majors was x plus 8. It was the starting salary for psychology plus $8,000 more. So then x plus 8 is equal to 35 for x plus 8, which gives us 43. So that is, x plus 8 was representing the starting salary for a business major is $43,000. Okay, so if that is the business majors, they're making $43,000 as their starting salary. Well, we still have English majors left. So English majors was psychology, which was X, plus $3,000. So that would be 35 for psychology plus $3,000 more, which would give you 38,000 starting salary for English majors. We figured out all three different majors starting salaries. We had psychology was 35,000, business majors was 43,000, and then English majors was 38,000. The last step in any word problem is always to check your answer. So let's check. If we take these three major starting salaries and add them together, we should get $116,000. So let's check this. We had 35,000 for psychology, 43,000 for business, and 38 for English majors, if you add those together, it will come out to be $116,000. So that is correct. We found out all three starting salaries for English, business, and psychology majors. Okay, so look at example five next. This is gonna work very similarly. Researchers have surveyed college freshmen every year since 1969. The figure below shows that attitudes about some life goals have changed dramatically over the years, and this has been shown to be true. In particular, the freshman class in 2009 was more interested in making money than freshmen in 1969. In 1969, 42% of first year college students considered being well off financially essential or very important. Only 42%. Well, that percentage, starting at 42%, this percentage has increased approximately 0.9% every year since then between 1969 and 2009. So looking at the bar graph, notice that in 1969, being well off financially was only considered important to only 42% of all first year college students. Whereas in 2009, that percentage had increased to 78% of first year college students considering being well off financially was important to them or essential. So if the percentage started off at 42% and it increased by approximately 0.9% every year, if this trend continues, by which year will all college freshmen consider being well financially essential or very important? So let's start off by using the five-step strategy again. Let X represent the number of years after 1969.
So we're trying to find out how many years after 1969, or in other words, what year after 1969, all college freshmen will consider being well financially very important or essential. Well, the key word is the word all. So all means 100% of college freshmen. So this is how we're going to set up the equation. If you start off at 42%, so 42, everything will be in percents. So start off with 42%. How many of these 0.9% increases, so 0.9 times x, so it's 0.9 every year increase, how long will it take before this percentage with those increases reaches 100%? So this is the important step. Setting up the equation so you can solve for x. So it's a linear equation, so you can isolate the x on one side by subtracting 42 to the right side of the equation. So 0.9x equals 58. So after you divide by 0.9, you'll find out that the answer is about 64.44. If you round to two decimal places, years after 1969. So now, that does not answer what the problem is asking for. It's asking for what year. Well, we found out how many years after 1969 it is. So take 1969 and add 64.44 years, and that is 2033.44, or that would be the year 2033. So in the year 2033, if this trend continues of increasing 0.9% every year, in the year 2033, that's when all college freshmen will say being well financially is very important or essential to them. All right, the next three examples are going to deal with money. So example six, we're going to have what's called a price reduction or a discount on a digital camera. The local computer store is having a terrific sale on digital cameras where they have a 40% reduction on the price or a discount, a 40% discount where you purchase a digital camera for $276. So that was how much you paid to get the camera after the discount. What was the camera's price before the discount? Or in other words, what was the retail price? So the first step is to represent the variable. So let X represent the price of the camera. before the discount. Or price reduction. Alright, notice that there's no other unknowns in the problem, so we don't have to worry about step two. Step three is setting up the equation correctly, because otherwise if we solve the equation correctly, but it, the equation is not correct, then the answer won't make any sense. So, we are going into the computer store and buying the camera. We are trying to find out the camera start off at X dollars. That's the original price before the discount. You take away 40% because that's what the discount was, 40%. But notice from the previous video we talked about percents. A percent is just not always by itself. It's percent of something. It was 40% off of, so times, the original price. So X attract 40% times X. After the price reduction, you pay $276. So this is the important step. You need to set the equation correctly. So this becomes x subtract 0.4x after you change 40% to a decimal and equals 276. x subtract 0.4 is 0.6x equals 276. So in other words, another way of thinking about this is that if you took 40% off the price, you are paying 60% of some price to give you 276. So if you divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.6, x is equal to 460. And so x is $460 for the original price of the camera. So now we solve the equation. The last step is to check the answer. So this means 
that the 40% discount was $460 was how much was the original price times 40% so $460 times 40% gives you 184 so this is $184 saved from the discount so if you took $460 and subtracted $184 from what you saved from the discount you should get $276 from what you actually paid so this is the correct answer all right let's try the next example in the next example we're going to need a little bit of knowledge about what's called simple interest simple interest is where interest is calculated only on the amount of money that you invest so interest on the original amount is called simple interest and the original amount that's invested is called what's called the principal so the simple interest formula that we're going to need to figure out the next problem is I equals P times R times T. This is called the simple interest formula. I is the interest. P is the principal or how much is deposited or the original investment. The R stands for the interest rate as a decimal and the T is time always in years. So I is the interest rate. So I is the interest where you have the principal P invested at an annual interest rate R and it's for T years. So why do we need to know this formula? Well, dual investment problems like the one we're going to do in the next couple examples involve different amounts of money in two or more investments at different interest rates. So let's look at example seven. We're going to solve what's called a dual interest problem. Suppose that your grandmother needs your help. She has $50,000 to invest. Part of the money is going to be invested in non-insured bonds, which gives you 15% annual interest. The rest of the money is to be invested into a government-insured certificate of deposit, or commonly called a CD, and that gives you 7% annual interest. So you have two different accounts. You have a total of $50,000. Part of it is going into 15% interest account, and the other part is going to a 7% interest account. So your grandmother told you that she requires $6,000 per year in extra income from the combination of these two accounts or investments. How much should you invest at each different interest rate so that she gets $6,000 every year in extra income? So we read the problem carefully. Let's start with the variable. So let X represent so there's two different unknowns in the problem. We don't know how much we invest at 15% and how much we invest at 7%. And so it doesn't matter which one you call X. So let's call, so let's let X represent the amount invested in the non-insured bonds. paying 15% annual interest. All right, so if X is how much money that you put into the 15% account, how much would be left over for the other account, which is giving you 7% annual interest in the CD? Well, you only have $50,000 total. So part of it's going into 15%, the rest of it would go into the 7%, which is 50,000 subtract x represents the amount invested in the government issued certificate of deposit or CD paying 7% interest. So notice that if you take these two amounts, if you take 50,000 subtract X and you add X, 
the X's would cancel out and you would have 50,000, which is the total amount of money that your grandmother has to invest. So the total amount invested is X plus 50,000 minus X, which would just be $50,000. So that's a good way to check your progress through the, through the first couple steps of the five-step process. We set up the variable x to represent how much was in the 15% account. Well, we have two unknowns, so relate the other unknown back in terms of x, which would be 50,000 minus x would go into the 7% account, because there's only $50,000 total when you add those two amounts together. So now the next part is set up the equation. Well, we need to use the simple interest formula. which was I equals P times R times T to set up the equation. And solve to find the amounts invested in each account. So since we have two different accounts, we're going to use a simple interest formula for each account. So let's start with the non-insured bonds. We need to use a simple interest formula to figure out how much interest did we earn from the non-insured bonds. Well, let's figure out each part separately. P is the principal. It's X dollars invested. That's how much we were going to tell grandmother to put into this account. The R, the annual interest rate was 15%, which is 0.15 as a decimal. Make sure you change the percent to a decimal before you use it in the formula. And T is your grandmother needed the extra income every year. So every year she needs this much interest. So let's go back up to the formula and figure out what would be the expression that represents the interest. The interest would be X for the amount for X for the principal times the interest rate, 0.15, times one year. So this gives you 0.15 times X for the interest amount. So now the other account was the government insured CD. Let's do the same thing as we did before. So let's figure out what P is. P was the amount that we invested in the CD. Well, we said it was 50,000 subtract X because we only had $50,000 total. So we're investing this amount. The interest rate was 7%, so a little bit lower interest rate, which is 0 0.07 as a decimal. And again, your grandmother needs this amount every year. So T is one year. So going up back up to the formula, you have I equals 50,000 subtract X is the P. So make sure that goes in parentheses times the interest rate, which is 0.07, times one year. So 0.07 times one is 0.07. So if you distribute to remove any grouping symbols, this turns out to be 3,500 subtract 0.07x. So that's the interest from the CD. So now you might be wondering, that's a lot of work. We haven't even set up the equation yet. Well, if you take these two amounts, these two interest amounts, and you add them together, your grandmother needed $6,000 in interest. So the equation would be 0.15x plus 3,500 subtract 0.7x, and that needs to be $6,000 every year. So this is the most important step, making sure that the equation is set up correctly, and the only way to set this equation up is to use the simple interest formula for both accounts separately. So now let's solve. 0.15x Subtract 0.07x is 0.08x plus 3,500 equals 6,000. Move the 3,500 to the right side of the equation. So subtract. So 0.08x equals 2,500. And then divide by 0.08 to isolate the x on one side of the equation. This will be $31,250. Well, X represented the amount that was invested in the non-insured bonds. So $31,250 invested in 
non-insured bonds. And then how much of the $50,000 is remaining to figure out how much is invested at the CD. Take 50,000, subtract X. So 50,000 subtract 31,250 gives you $18,750 invested in the CD. So for your grandmother to get exactly $6,000 in extra income every year, she needs to invest $31,250 in the non-insured bonds and $18,750 in the CD. There is no other combination of money deposited into, into the two accounts to give you exactly $6,000. This is the only answer. All right, so now that we know how to solve dual investment problems, let's try example eight. This is set up the exact same way, but this time it's not about your grandmother, it's about yourself. Suppose that you invest $11,000 into two different accounts, two different savings accounts. One of them gives you 5% interest, the other gives you 8% interest. The total amount of interest earned in one year is $730. How much was invested at each interest rate? Let's solve this exactly the same way as we did the last problem. So start off with the variable. Let x represent the amount invested in 5% interest rate. Then, how much money do we have investing into the 8% account? Well, if this was X for the 5% account, and we only have $11,000 total, 11,000 subtract X represents the amount invested at 8%. So notice, if you take these two amounts, x and 11,000 subtract x, and you add them together, you get 11,000, which is the total amount. So now let's use the simple interest formula for each of these two different accounts. So we have the 5% account. So we have i equals p times r times t for the simple interest. The interest would be the principal for this account was x dollars at 5%, so x for p. The interest rate was 5%, that would be 0 0.05 as a decimal, times one year, because you want money, $730 in interest every year. So this is 0.05x. So now I'll figure out the 8% account. So I equals P times R times T for the simple interest formula. We want to calculate what the interest would be for the 8% accounts. Well, the amount that we're investing is 11,000 minus X for this account. The interest rate is 8%, so 0 0.08, and then times one year again. So just like the last problem, 0 0.08 times one is 0 0.08, and then you need to distribute to both terms to remove any grouping symbols. 11,000 times 0 0.08 is 880, subtract 0.08x, so that is the interest amount for the 8% account. Now, just like the last problem, you want to have a total interest amount of $730. So if you add these two amounts together, it should be $730. And that's where you get the equation. 0.05x plus 880, subtract 0.08x equals 730. So notice that there's only one variable, just x, and so you can isolate the x on one side of the equation. So combine like terms first, because the x's are already on the same side. Negative 0.03x plus 880 equals 730. Subtract 880 on both sides of the equation to move it away from the x term. So that gives you negative 0.03x is equal to negative 150. And now divide both sides by negative 0 0.03, so x is equal to 5,000. 
And since X was representing the amount invested at 5% interest, this is $5,000 invested in the account paying 5% interest. So $5,000 is at the 5% interest account, and we only had $11,000 total. That means $6,000 has to be in the other account. So 11,000 subtract X gives you 11,000 subtract 5,000. Now that we found X, and so you get 6,000. Invested in the account paying 8% interest. So notice that these two amounts, $5,000 and $6,000, add up to $11,000. And if you plug in $5,000 back into the simple interest formula with the 5% interest, and then you plug in $6,000 back into the simple interest formula for the 8% interest, you'll come up with exactly $730 total interest for the whole year. So this gives you a couple examples on how to solve dual investment problems. You need to set them up using the simple interest formula for each different account. Okay, the last type of problem that we're going to talk about in terms of word problems and using the five-step strategy is with geometry problems, where you have perimeter, circumference, area, or volume that comes up. So sometimes in geometry problems, they require using basic geometric ideas or formulas. The following table contains formulas for calculating the area, the perimeter, volume of very common geometric shapes. So a square. If you have perimeter, perimeter means this the distance around the figure. So you have one S for one side, another S for the bottom side, another S, another S. So you have S plus S plus S plus S. That gives you four times S for the perimeter. And the area of a square is length times width. So S times S gives you the area is S squared. A rectangle, the area is length times width. So width times length is the area. The perimeter, notice that you have a width and another side that's a width opposite from it, length, and another side that's a length across from it. So you have two widths and two lengths to add to get the perimeter, so 2L plus 2W. Circumference is another way of saying perimeter in terms of a circle. So circumference is 2 times the number pi times R, which is the radius of the circle. So that would be the distance around the circle. It's 2 times pi times R. The area of a circle is pi times radius squared, or pi r squared. A triangle is half a rectangle, so the area makes sense to be one half base times height for a triangle. The trapezoid is one half times the height of the trapezoid times the sum of the bases, so base a, the one side of the one side the trapezoid sits on and the other side the trapezoid sits on. So A plus B times H times a half. So those are all the two-dimensional shapes. Three-dimensional shapes, you have what's called volume. So with a cube, all the sides are the same. So you have length, width, and a height. So the volume would be S times S times S or S cubed. For a rectangular solid or a rectangular prism or a box, the volume is length times width times height. So for a circular cylinder, the volume is pi times r squared, so it's the area of the circle, times the height of the cylinder. The sphere is 4 thirds times pi times radius cubed is the volume. And then a cone is 1 third times pi r squared times the height is the volume for a cone. So in this next problem, we're going to be dealing with the perimeter of a rectangle. So we'll be looking at a rectangle for this next problem. The formula states for a perimeter of a rectangle, you take the sum of twice the length and twice the width. So two length plus two widths, and you add those together to get the perimeter of a rectangle. So example nine, finding the dimensions of a pool. The length of a rectangular pool is six meters less than twice the width of the pool. If the pool's perimeter is 126 meters, what are the dimensions? And the dimensions are referring to the length and the width. So notice that they're asking for two different things in the problem. They're asking for the length and the width, but we don't need two variables. Notice that this first sentence says the length 
is 6 meters less than twice the width. The length is written in terms of the width. So let's let x be the width. So let x represent the width of the pool. in meters. Don't forget the units. So if x is the width, now we have a way of figuring out what the length is. Then the length is twice the width, so that means 2 times x, but then 6 meters less than that. So 2x subtract 6 in meters. All right, so that's the first two steps of the five-step process. We set up the variable, and then we also have the other unknown in terms of x. Sometimes it helps to actually draw the figure so that we know exactly what size are we actually adding together to get the perimeter. So with this rectangle, the width is x meters, so that means the opposite side is also x meters. The length is 2x minus 6, and so the other side is 2x minus 6 as well. The perimeter is the distance around the rectangle. So if you add those four sides together, you should get the perimeter. So x plus x plus 2x minus 6 plus 2x minus 6 is 126 meters for the perimeter. So that's the important step, setting up the equation correctly. So now combine all your like terms on the same side of the equation first. So x plus x plus 2x plus 2x gives you 6x. Subtract 6 plus subtract 6 gives you minus 12 equals 126. Add 12 to both sides of the equation gives you 6x equals 138. And if you divide both sides of the equation by 6, you find out that x is equal to 23. 23 meters. And that is the width of the pool. So we only found out half the answer so far. They want the dimensions of the pool, so that's the length and the width. We just have the width, so we still need to figure out the length. So go back to what we expressed the length as. The length was 2x minus 6. So 2 times 23 for the width, then subtract 6. So 46 subtract 6 gives you 40. So the length of the pool is 40 meters. So the width of the pool is 23 meters and the length of the pool is 40 meters. If you add 23 meters and 23 meters, 40 meters and 40 meters, it should come out to be exactly 126 meters for the perimeter. So this finished up our discussion on solving word problems using the five-step strategy using linear equations. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about solving quadratic equations using factoring.